Um, I started basically 10 years ago with the idea that electric cars can be much more than they were at that time. And it's kind of interesting, I was talking with my colleagues here that are with me in this, um, on this conference, and it feels very similar to where the autonomous driving technology is today, um, or the autonomous driving industry. So 10 years ago, the perception of electric cars was something like this. Uh, you guys here from the UK probably know this car better than the others, the GWIS. And I was thinking that, you know, why would electric cars look like that? Why would they be boring, dull, um, not something exciting? And basically the idea was, um, so cars like this were designed by people who don't like cars, who consider them a necessary evil, who consider, you know, that people need something to get from point A to point B and just as a utility. But I was crazy about cars all my life and I thought that this doesn't have to be the case, that electric cars can be fun and exciting and all of that. And I will, you know, being here yesterday, I realized that this story might not be so relevant for, for this um, conference, talking about electric cars because it feels a little bit old already, to be honest, things are moving fast, quickly. But I think it's an interesting analogy to where autonomous, the autonomous driving industry is now and what will happen in the next decade. So first I will just talk a little bit about electric cars and about our company, but then I'll come to more about the future of mobility. So I was, as I said, crazy about cars all my life. When I was 18 years old, I bought myself an old BMW 3 Series. It was four years older than I was. So it's a 1984 BMW. You can turn it down a little bit. So I did stupid things with that car like this. So of course it didn't survive for very long. And then I decided to build it um, into an electric car. And not just into an electric car, but actually into a very fast, very exciting electric car, and to use it to race against other cars, against gas-powered cars. And at that time, nobody was racing electric cars against gas-powered cars. And people were very surprised to see an electric car on a racetrack, and were laughing and making things up, like, you know, what are you doing with a washing machine on the racetrack and stuff like that. And at the beginning, I had lots of problems. Uh, the car would fall apart, the battery would start burning, the motor would uh, fall apart and stuff like that. But after every race, I kept coming back and made the car faster and faster, better and better. And after some time, I started winning. So actually, in 2010, I won the first time, which was basically the first time that electric cars won against gas-powered cars in the same category. So people started to pay attention to what I was doing. At that time, uh, Tesla came out with the Roadster claiming it was the fastest uh, electric car, which it was not. <laughs> and um, I was using this car every day uh, to go to college. Um, I homologated it, I used it in snow, in summer, in winter, and so on, in all different conditions, and I learned a lot. And then in 2011, uh, I broke five FIA in Guinness World Records with that car, which is quite funny because this old BMW still holds those records today. So that was the trigger to start a company. And I wanted to make the world's fastest electric car, so not just convert an old BMW, but actually make a car from scratch to use all of the potential that electric powertrains have. But I was just a guy in a garage in an industry dominated by the big dogs and in Croatia. So, Croatia is a beautiful country, but not for industry, especially not for the car industry. So when you Google the automotive industry in Europe, this is the picture you get. And pretty much the only country without any single dot in Europe is Croatia. So the little odd thing on the right side of, of Italy, that's Croatia. Um, long story short, the entrepreneurial side of it is, our entrepreneurial story is, I think, quite interesting. It was really difficult to get the company from the ground, um, to get started. Uh, with no venture capital funds in the country, with nobody in the uh, country doing um, anything similar, so we couldn't hire anybody, um, and we couldn't afford people from abroad. But basically, um, at that time in 2010, uh, when I decided to do this, I met Adriano, who's actually sitting here somewhere. He's our head of design today. Back then, he was working for GM as a designer. Um, and we decided to build a car, this crazy idea of building a car. He was doing the, the design part of the car during the night uh, because he was working for GM and I was doing it after 
university. But the most difficult part was just getting the money to do it, um, talking with the investors. So that was basically most of my job to keep the company afloat all the time. But we have made it. The first car um, was presented in 2011, and since then we have improved it a lot. So here you can see one of our cars, the Concept 1. So when I started a company and wanted to do this, I didn't have anybody to ask for advice in Croatia. I went to the University of Mechanical Engineering in Zagreb and they told me you cannot build a car in Croatia, it's impossible. The sooner you give up, the less people will go under with you. But I think we have proven them wrong. And uh, what I said at the beginning, that we wanted to prove that electric cars can be exciting and fast and beautiful and all of that, I think we have done that. Uh, and the industry opinion has changed. The, the general public's opinion has changed a lot since then. So now it's difficult to remember. You know, now you have Tesla, you have Formula E, you have all of this fancy stuff. You have us and others that are doing this. And perception of electric cars has changed completely. Ten years ago, it was shady little conferences with a bunch of crazy people. <laughs> Sounds familiar. <laughs> so, no, nothing against this. It's a, it's a great event, but um, uh, electric car conferences uh, looked uh, very interesting 10 years ago. So um, Jeremy Clarkson is a big, like, let's say he doesn't like electric cars or didn't like electric cars. He said our car changed his mind. If we change his mind, I guess we can change everybody's mind. Um, and basically changing of perception of electric cars. I think in the last 10 years, it's a success. We, we were a small part of it, but Tesla has done the most of the heavy lifting. So um, I think that's a big step and it, it proves that, that things can move qu quickly. So now the electric car industry is picking up like crazy. You have all of these graphs just like in the autonomous driving world of you know, prediction of percentage of the market share of electric cars. I have seen them, you know, all of them in, from the big companies, from the um, advisor companies, from the big OEMs, from the tier ones. Everybody has their different opinions. Nobody really knows. It's a crystal ball. But it's picking up. It's growing. But I personally believe that electric cars are a very small change. It's keeping everybody in the comfort zone. Um, nobody has really to change. Uh, it's just a very, very small change, actually. You don't go to the gas station, you just charge the car somewhere else. You still own the car, you still drive the car. The supplier builds the components, the OEM builds the car, the, the customer buys the car. Nothing has changed, status quo still remains. Uh, the big change is really um, what I think is happening here, what people that are here in this room are doing. So just a little bit more about the cars. So this is the Concept 1, our first model that we have presented in uh, 2011. So it's the fastest accelerating car in the world currently. Um, faster than any gas-powered car or, or hybrid car. But in the last eight years, we have learned a lot, we have grown a lot, so we have presented a new car in Geneva uh, in 2018. It's the most powerful car ever produced, uh, 2,000 horsepower almost, 1,900, uh, less than 2 seconds, 0 to 60 or 0 to 100 kilometers per hour, and very filled with technology. Lots of things that are going on there. So we wanted really to show everything um, and make like a statement um, in terms of performance, usability, technology, but also autonomous driving features. And also making it beautiful, so Adriano has done a nice job of uh, not just making a functional car, but also a beautiful one without any um, unnecessary items. So everything there has a purpose and has been developed and iterated many times to optimize absolutely everything on the car. Uh, also in terms of interior and driver monitoring and stuff like that. And what we are very proud of is that the car is completely developed internally. That's very unique about us. We develop and design and engineer and simulate and produce most of the stuff completely in-house. 
So the company has two pillars. On one side, our hypercars, where we want to show what's possible, what we as a company can do and what electric cars can do. But the main business of the company is developing and producing components for uh, other car manufacturers. So we are doing a bunch of product, projects for big car companies and for smaller car companies. Um, by the way, one of the shareholders of the company is Porsche or Volkswagen Group, uh, which was made public last year. I'm still the majority shareholder. And we have basically grown from this little garage in 2010 to more than 500 people today and still growing strongly, basically pretty much doubling every year. That's where the gray hair comes from. So um, for us, the next topic is, of course, autonomous driving and new mobility. And we are doing some things there um, in, in different areas. I will focus first on what we are developing for our own cars, for the C2. So we, we are developing something called driver coach. Um, so of course, as you all know, uh, the advancements in neural networks and machine learning are making all of this possible today, um, that there is lots of advancement in, um, in autonomous driving because of the uh, fundamentals that have changed. But what we basically want to achieve with our system that we are developing for the C2 is to add driving excitement and autonomous driving. So 10 years ago, when I said we want to make a fast and exciting electric car, people were like, okay, these two things don't go together. Like driving excitement and electric cars, it's contradictory. It just doesn't work. But I think that we have proven that it's possible. And the same goes today with autonomous driving, where people think that um, the autonomous driving will take away driving from people. And of course, they are right in some way. But we want also to show in some use cases that it can enhance the user experience and the driving. So, for example, what we are doing is this driver coach where a car, so it's a very powerful car and most of the customers don't have the skills to really use it. So what we are doing is uh, you go to a racetrack and this system uh, knows the track and can give you a perfect lap of a Formula One driver, for example, where you can really see the, um, the limits of the car. So the car drives it fully autonomously and then when the driver takes over, the system monitors what the driver is doing, keeping the driver within the limits as a guardian angel and coaching the driver how to be better, accelerate earlier, uh, brake uh, later, whatever, turn in um, at a different time and so on. So to do that, we have lots of sensors. So we have nine cameras, uh, six radars, uh, one LiDAR, 12 ultrasonic sensors, um, and lots of processing power. So we do all the perception internally um, and uh, all the software, but we use off-the-shelf hardware. So pretty much the only hardware in the car that's not our own is this um, uh, processing unit for the autonomous driving, which is an NVIDIA Pegasus unit. Uh, so everything else, the perception and the, the algorithms um, and decision-making is done internally. Sasha, who is also sitting here, is leading the department of autonomous driving in our, in our company. So it's a, let's say, specific application we don't want to build, you know, to compete with Waymo or with Aptiv in general autonomy from A to B, but really high performance uh, applications. So one of the challenges that we have is to build an autonomous driving system that can drive more than 300 kilometers per hour on the racetrack safely. And, you know, people uh, are talking a lot about how autonomous driving is ready, but the regulation, the regulators are not. I don't agree with that. Um, so how many of you here have actually tried to build a road going autonomous car? How many are involved in something like that? Okay, so the challenge is really, it's not there yet. So try to find a steering rack <laughs> that's, uh, that has the redundancy and AZ level D ISO 262 uh, requirement. Good luck with that. Um, the braking system has to have redundancy. All the vehicle control units have to have the safety levels to be able to handle this. The whole vehicle architecture has to be different. That's something that people don't talk about. The industry is not ready yet. There is no components. There is, the, the standards are not uh, ready yet in many cases. Uh, the vehicle architecture is in many cases still not there. So you need redundancy, you need safety, you need fallback options. That's not there. Then the computing power. You need huge computers. Um, that require lots of energy, that are super expensive, that need cooling um, to make this possible. Uh, Tesla, for example, is building their own. We use NVIDIA system, which is really good, but it's very expensive at the moment. 
data is a huge topic. So one car generates uh, per hour, I think, 60 terabytes, right? So in, ten, in 1,000 hours of driving, that's six petabytes. One petabyte costs like 250,000 euros. So one car can generate data. So I think if, like in our fleet of uh, data collection cars, one car driven eight hours per day every workday, not the weekends, collects uh, compressed, I think, one petabyte of data, and you need to have backups of that, which is like 250,000 euro per car per year just to store the data. So that's a challenge, uh, a challenge of scale. So we need many pet petabytes of data, and we are building up data centers next to our company. And I think in the next year, we'll have more storage than all of Croatia combined uh, in our data center to store the, the data that the cars are generating. Then, of course, legislation and social behavior of the drivers and so on. And I guess many of you here are aware of the MIT Moral Challenge and stuff like that, so a lot of moral questions. If, if you don't know about it, uh, I suggest you to, to go to the website. It's really interesting. Like It gives you scenarios and to see how people would like autonomous cars to behave. Because the question is, do we want autonomous cars to behave like us, uh, which is probably always selfish, or we want them to have other moral standards? So it's interesting. Uh, just maybe uh, taking a step back and seeing the big picture. So what I think a lot of people in the industry are missing, everybody thinks about the big change to the industry. I personally think this will be a much, much, much bigger change than just the industry. It will change, I think, every person's life, at least in the Western world, but I think also in the developing countries. Um, and I would compare it to what the internet and smartphones did to our society in the last 10 years. I mean, in the, in the magnitude of the change, I hope it will not uh, have negative impacts. So, you know, people dying in traffic accidents, it's like a full Boeing 737 falling from the sky every hour of every day. That's 1.2 million people a year. The cost of accidents, for example, in the US, it's $870 billion uh, in 2014. I guess it's more today, which is 9% of US GDP. So which is 29, 29 cents per mile, which is more than gas cost or depreci depreciation cost of the vehicle itself per mile. So accidents are a bigger cost factor, actually, than uh, any other cost of driving the vehicle when broken down on the per mile basis. Similar thing goes for the congestion. So there's 50 million, 50 billion hours spent behind the wheel, and there's just 240 billion working hours in the US. So four to eight of these 50 billion hours are you know, just sitting in traffic, which is 8% of GDP. So um, congestion and accidents have a higher impact on GDP than Croatia uh, in percent in the US, then Croatia has dependency on tourism. And Croatia's dependency on tourism is the highest in the world, I think. So like, the potential is huge. Then, um, you know, how everything will change when the ut vehicle utilization goes from 4% today to 70%. When the car drives not 30,000 kilometers per, per year, but it drives 250,000 kilometers per year. How do cars change? One robot taxi can replace more than 20 traditional cars. So the OEMs, that's why the OEMs are scared. How does the OEM landscape change when one car replaces 20? So 4 million robot taxis could basically replace half of the US fleet, which is 100 million. So 4 million cars could replace 50 million cars. What happens to other things like 80% of the police is dedicated to traffic. We will not need them anymore once all cars become autonomous. But of course, there will be a long transition period. 80% um, of airport revenues comes from parking. Uh, the real estate market completely changes when you care less about the, um, the time spent commuting because you will use the time very differently. Um, yeah, so I'm a car guy. I love cars, but taking everything into consideration, owning cars will not make much sense in the future. So owning cars will be similar to uh, what we, we believe uh, to race horses today. So everybody used to have horses 200 years ago. Today, just very few people have them. 
So what happens then to the car manufacturers? What happens to T1 suppliers? How will the industry change? So what I think is that all of this brought together is that autonomous driving and new mobility will have a much bigger impact on society than we think. It will be one of the most single largest changes for society and a huge positive change for society in terms of um, safety so people will not die anymore hopefully we will achieve one day you know 90 percent reduction in accidents uh, health costs uh, congestion uh, productivity gains because people will use their time better and so on so and why is everybody after it because this is how um, an average American household is spending their money so the biggest uh, number is housing, 16%, 14% is transport. So it's a $6.5 trillion industry. And that's why everybody's after it. And the, the potential is, as we have heard here also yesterday, um, the reduction in, in per mile cost to a fraction of what it is today. The OEMs are doing it very conservatively and incrementally. The startups, <laughs> yeah, they are uh, doing it in their own way. So the question is, who will build the cars in the future? Who will own them? Will transport even be free? Will people even care about the car? Um, w will the population accept this? But we don't know this. The time will tell. And when it will happen, it's difficult to tell. Uh, but if we see the changes that happened in the last decades, so this was in 2005, I think the inauguration of the Pope, right, Marco? Uh, and uh, then um, eight years later, it looked like this. So the same event uh, eight years later. So change can happen quickly. Let's see what will happen in the coming decades. Thank you very much.